Can we stimulate ourselves to death? To answer this question, I want you to picture a scenario. A scenario far off into the distant future. TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, and social media in general has gone larger. What is the next step? How does it become more pervasive in our lives? Social media already consumes significant portions of our time. With Statista stating 151 minutes are spent per day on social media. But that figure is likely wrong. People spend an average of 3 hours and 15 minutes per day on their phones. And social media is consumed while we work, do chores, or play video games. TikTok has evolved content into short one-minute bursts of super entertaining dopamine hits. And content in general is going through a form of selection, evolving to become more and more entertaining as the years go by. I wish I could say I have the self-control to avoid this trap. But I don't. I scroll shorts videos, love podcasts, and listen to my favorite YouTubers just like everyone else. Which got me thinking, what can we do about it? Now that Pandora's box has been opened, can we ever go back to just enjoying a moment of silence, a moment of peace, without being overwhelmed by a fear of missing out or an anxiety that makes us return to content? The truth is, I don't know. The dopaminergic reward system is a powerful thing. And without dopamine, most species would have died off a long time ago. But dopamine is not the culprit in our shrinking attention spans. In fact, I would argue it has very little to do with it. The culprit has more to do with a constantly evolving treadmill, a strong selection pressure, and a misguided sense of self. Let's imagine a scenario. If you go to the store and buy new clothes, how do you feel afterwards? Generally good, right? It becomes your new favorite outfit for quite some time. But after a period of a couple of weeks or maybe a month, it no longer breeds the same excitement. It soon transitions from the cool new outfit you've been getting loads of compliments on to just another of the many outfits you already have in your closet. This is the hedonic treadmill. Generally speaking, we eventually grow accustomed to where we are in life and lose appreciation for the things that once brought us joy. The anticipation, the novelty that once caused dopamine levels to surge no longer causes the same reaction. The hedonic treadmill is characterized by a return to baseline happiness regardless of what happens to you. Now, I want to clarify that this can be advantageous, especially because it occurs in responses to negative life events as well. But where it's particularly pervasive is when it comes to happiness. As our achievements, our goals are reached, we begin to feel empty again and soon have to chase something else to get our quick fix. But this is just one part of the equation. The other is the selection pressure content is continually moving through. Novelty is highly addictive. It's the basis of the hedonic treadmill, and when paired with easily digestible media, it's like a drug. Richard Dawkins, an evolutionary biologist I've talked about on this channel before, coined the term memes. A meme, analogous to a gene in biological evolution, refers to an idea, behavior, style, or cultural practice that spreads within a culture and undergoes a process of evolution by natural selection. Just like genes, Memes spread through imitation and evolve over time as they are passed on from one individual to the next. In this process, some memes become widespread and endure, while others fade away. The content landscape is the environment, and we are the selection pressure choosing which content spreads and which dies off. Now let's unveil the complete picture by combining these two concepts together. Initially, content on platforms like YouTube held a captivating allure, particularly in its infancy. The novelty of the medium contributed to its addictive nature. However, as with any form of novelty, our familiarity with the content grew over time. This is the hedonic treadmill. The growth of YouTube, driven by various incentives, brought in a multitude of creators, but also a multitude of viewers. This resulted in fierce competition, similar to any landscape where natural selection persists. So, to stand out among the plethora of videos, new creators had to adapt. This led to a constant cycle of differentiation, be it through improved writing, editing, or the uniqueness of their video concepts. As fresh content rules in prominence and social media algorithms refine their ability to cater to our preferences, the hedonic treadmill persisted. Each surge of excitement from new videos gradually normalizing, causing a decline in interest until the next wave of innovative content emerged. This cycle is further intensified by the sheer diversity of content available. From quick one-minute videos to more extensive podcasts, our viewing habits become more versatile, contributing to the ongoing dynamic of the hedonic treadmill. This brings us to the present landscape, 
with the ever-evolving world of social media and our insatiable appetite for novel content continue to shape our online experiences, directly affecting our actual lives as well. Which brings us to part two, a misguided sense of self. One search on YouTube will show you a common trend that's been floating around the internet for the past few years. Dopamine detox, they call it. A fast, a starvation that will reset your dopamine levels and help you overcome content addiction. On the surface, it makes sense. Content consumption is an addiction, and just like any addiction, the best way to quit is to try and stop doing it. It's simple, really. Remove yourself from the stimulus and watch your dopamine levels reset. As a result, your life will change. But reality paints a very different picture. Dopamine is not a molecule we get as a reward for doing something. It is a molecule we get in the pursuit of something. And in fact, trying to accomplish a goal releases much more dopamine than actually achieving that goal. The biology on this is pretty clear. Dopamine is meant to guide us into doing things that will help us survive. It is dopamine that causes you to go to the fridge and eat some food. It is dopamine that makes you pursue relationships. And it is dopamine that guides us towards things we want, not some hit we get as a result of accomplishing the thing itself. Which is why dopamine is not the problem. The second metric of addiction is aimlessness, or as I call it, a misguided sense of self. The Rat Park experiment was a series of studies conducted in the 1970s with the goal of exploring how living conditions affect addiction. Traditional studies on self-administered drug use in animals used small, solitary cages. And Bruce Alexander hypothesized that these conditions might influence drug consumption. And so, he set out with the goal of figuring this out. To test this hypothesis, Rat Park was created, a large housing colony 200 times the size of a standard laboratory cage. It had 16 to 20 rats of both sexes, it provided things like food, space, and play items, and it was designed with the goal of creating a more enriched social environment. In Rat Park, rats were given access to two drink dispensers, one with a sweetened morphine solution and the other with plain tap water. The morphine solution was sweetened to reduce aversion to its taste, and the experiments were designed to test the rat's willingness to consume morphine. When isolated in small traditional cages, the rats showed an instant preference for morphine, with caged males consuming significantly more than rat park males. In rat park, rats completely resisted the morphine and actually showed a preference for the plain water. But the most interesting part of the experiment came from rats who were initially isolated but then moved to Rat Park before the experiment. These individuals already had an addiction to morphine. But when in Rat Park, they rejected stronger morphine solutions, but consumed more diluted ones, potentially suggesting a preference for the sweet water, but without the disrupting effects of morphine on their social behavior. The results of these studies have been quite impactful ever since they were released. And there are a few key takeaways. The main one being, while environment is not the only thing that influences addiction, it certainly plays a large role. Anecdotally speaking, throughout our history, survival was always chief on our mind. It was what everything circled back to. Life was hard. For 95% of humanity, life expectancy was half of what it is today. Most people had a lot of kids because they already knew half were going to die. And diseases had the potential to wipe out the majority of our population. But in recent decades, the struggle has shifted. It's no longer about survival. Today, we are more comfortable than ever have more freedoms than ever, yet we are also more depressed than ever. Because the struggle that made us human still weighs heavily on our shoulders. But now, it is not a struggle for survival. It is a struggle for purpose. Content at its root is a distraction. An object used to help us fill a void, to help distract us from the larger problems we face in our lives. In the Rat Park experiment, when rats had friends and mating opportunities and activities they could engage in that brought enjoyment, such as play, they were willing and able to overcome their addictions. Within this framework, it's very possible to draw a connection to our own lives. Obviously, humans are a lot more complicated and many different elements impact our addictions, but being aware of how your environment fuels what you pursue is the first necessary step in change. Which brings up another question, how do we change? Imagine waking up one morning and feeling a sense of purpose coursing through your veins. No longer are you consumed by the relentless pursuit of meaningless distraction, endlessly scrolling through feeds and invested in highly polarizing content meant to pull a reaction out of you. Instead, you awaken with clarity. You're driven, renewed by a sense of direction and fulfillment. This is the journey toward breaking free from any addiction, 
and it begins with reclaiming control over your environment. In the Rat Park experiment, rats housed in enriched social environments showed a remarkable resistance to addiction. They had friends, mating opportunities, and engaging activities that brought them joy. Similarly, humans thrive when surrounded by enriching environments that foster connection, purpose, and meaning. But unlike in rats, we can't just be dropped in a new social environment. Instead, our social environments are ones we ourselves have to create. So it's pointless to start here. Instead, we have to start with the way we think. This last part is much less scientific, but it's something I've been thinking about recently and I think it will help for anyone who wants to scale back their use on social media. Nihilism is the idea that life lacks inherent meaning. Nothing matters except the hedonic pursuit of pleasure because it is the only tangible result we can quantify. Purposelessness, aimlessness, and a lack of goals all contribute to this philosophical outlook. But while it has a strong argument, it's missing one fundamental idea originally denoted by the fathers of nihilism. Nihilism equates life to a blank canvas. So yes, life has no meaning, but not because there is no meaning to be found. Instead, the meaning of life is yours to create, much like a blank canvas upon which you, the artist, are supposed to paint. It is the act of painting itself that brings meaning, not the painting. And it's funny how this philosophical outlook aligns with what we know about dopamine. The dopaminergic reward system is geared towards the anticipation of a reward, or the struggle of a journey, not the end product itself. Perhaps, then, addiction stems not from a lack of satisfaction, but from a misalignment between our innate drive for survival and the artificial stimuli of the digital world. The human brain is wired not for constant gratification, but for survival. It is built for the challenges of existence, the joys of connection, and the fulfillment of a goal. What I'm suggesting is that content addiction is not a byproduct of technological advancements or the dopamine-driven nature of our brains, even though they obviously play a role. Instead, it's deeply connected with our existential outlook on life. Nihilism, with its emphasis on life's lack of inherent meaning, can either serve as a paralyzing abyss or a catalyst for transformation. So instead of succumbing to nihilistic justification for further immersion into digital distractions, we have to harness the message of nihilism as a call to action. Content addiction fills a void, a void that is always present and always takes more to fill. But the true antidote lies not in endless scrolling or seeking momentary distraction. It lies in embracing the philosophy of nihilism as a call to action rather than a declaration of despair. And in doing so, maybe, we can reclaim agency over our lives by breaking our addiction to content.